everybody. Welcome to Elementary Read Aloud. I'm Miss Amanda with the Bexley Public Library, and today we are going to read a biography together. So this is the biography of Scott Joplin, and it's called The King of Ragtime, The Story of Scott Joplin. And this is by Stephen Costanza. This is a really, really cool one, and it's brand new. Love the art in it. Look at all these beautiful end papers. In the valley of the Red River, where the soil was as rich as most folks were poor, four states sat side by side like colors on a quilt, sewn from cotton picked by black hands, brown hands, tired and worn, but oh, how they clapped at night as voices lifted to the stars. These were the people that were newly free. Turning to music for solace and celebration, they sang spirituals, rang shouts, and hollers on Juneteenth, the 19th of June, when slavery in Texas ended for good. Under a canopy of red maple leaves, a hymn swayed in the breeze, sweet like sugar cane. Florence could see her son's eyes light up when she sang. Scott, the son of the man, who had been enslaved would someday make America dance. They'd call him the king, the king of ragtime. Scott grew halfway high to a sunflower. He hardly spoke above a whisper, preferring to listen to the sounds around him. Buzz, zzz, hummed the wasp's nest. Choo -choo, chimed the cicadas. Rum, bum, bum, grumbled the storm cloud. And no, wait, was that a train? And those old work songs, how they'd lift his hands and feet while he was shucking corn or carrying buckets of water heavier than himself. In Scott's home, music flowed like the great river itself. His father Giles fiddled, his mother Florence plucked the banjo and sang, while Monroe, Robert, Ossie, and William played guitar, box fiddle, spoons, and fiddle. Baby Myrtle helped with the spoons, and Scott played the cornet. That's like a trumpet. He learned the pieces his father had played in the big house, like shotchkes, polkas, and waltzes. Music filled the air like a breeze from Alabama. Times were tough and money was scarce. Giles found work laying tracks for the Texas and Pacific Railway for a dollar a day. Scott and his family traveled north where a patch of Texas, a scrap of Arkansas, and a stripe of Louisiana were all sewn into one town, Texarkana. Florence worked as a housemaid for a wealthy white family and Scott or er, brought Scott along to help with the cleaning and laundry. In the corner sat a piano, a square grand made of dark cherry wood, and 88 mother of pearl keys waited to be tickled. Scott's dust cloth lightly wiped the keys. Plink, plink, plink. He begged his mother to let him play it. Plink, plink, plonk. His heart skipped a beat where each finger pressed one key, then two. Pling, clang. That night, Scott's fingers were still wiggling when he should have been fast asleep. The next day, when his chores were done, Scott raced to the piano, and he felt the smooth keys dance beneath his fingers. He followed the beat of his mother's broom and plucked out a lullaby that she used to sing. Swoosh, 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 swish. A duet filled the room, a two-step for broom and piano. He made up a ditty for dusting, the day after a waltz for washing. He soon made up a tune for every chore. A seed was planted and took root. Florence knew a talent like Scott's had to be nurtured. Florence and Giles scrimped and saved, searching Texarkana for a piano. But in the young town, a piano was as rare as a two-headed cat. Then one day, they saw a notice piano for sale. It was a dusty old thing and out of tune in every string, but when Julius Weiss heard Scott play, he offered to give him piano lessons if Florence did his housework. The kindly man showed Scott everything about the piano, scales, fingering, harmony, and dynamics. Mr. Weiss taught him the popular tunes of the day, ballads by Foster, marches by Sousa, and arias from famous operas, songs of wizards and princes and dragons, music that sent shivers down Scott's spine. 
As soon as Scott finished learning one piece, he'd get busy on another. Whenever he got stuck, he stayed up late and practiced until he got it just right. Most of all, he loved composing his own music. He'd patch in a riff from a work song, a thread of gospel here, a string of ring shout there, sewing together new tunes to play for his mother the next day. All of Scott's neighbors began talking about the quiet kid who made a piano laugh out loud. He played at church socials, dances, and his favorite event of all, the annual Juneteenth celebration. Scott didn't need to play anyone else's music. He simply played from his heart, and it was beautiful. Scott, said Giles, the piano's all well and good, but it's not anything to hang your hopes on. You'll be a man soon, and a man's work is on the railroad. On the one hand, his father was right. The railroad offered steady work for a young African-American man when so few opportunities existed. But music was bubbling inside him, and courage came on like a head of steam. Scott needed to get on that train and see what was at the end of the line. Black people weren't allowed to sit with the white people, so Scott sat in the back of the train with the other black people searching for opportunity and a new life. Through hills, sand, hot stone, Scott rattled and rolled in that train. The bump-a-bump -bump rhythms in his left hand, the clickety-clackety in his right. Scott knew that he could make a living with music, but how? He soon found work playing the piano in saloons and honky-tonks all along the Mississippi Valley. No one noticed the quiet young man until he started making up his own tunes. An oompa, oompa in the left hand, the plinkety-plonk in the right. Toes tapped to the snappy rhythms. Who knew a piano could roar like a train or sing like a nightingale? It was the sound of Scott dreaming of a respectable career, not one confined to saloons. In 1893, Scott arrived in Chicago when the World's Fair was in full swing. He was dazzled by the electric lights and the world's first Ferris wheel, but most of all, there was music. Black pianists weren't allowed to play at the fair, but in the nearby cafes, a red hot piano sound filled the air. The left hand kept the beat, oompa, oompa. The right hand soared free as a bird, syncopated, agitated, bodacious, and proud. Folks pranced and danced to a new music called Ragtime. <laughs> so we have everybody dancing along to the Ragtime beat. What did Scott do with all that music buzzing in his brain? The music went round and round in his head. Scott took the train to Sedalia, Missouri, where he got work as a piano teacher and as a pianist at the Maple Leaf Club. He also attended the George R. Smith College for Negroes, where he learned to put his ideas on paper. Scott wrote two songs, a waltz and an oompa march in the popular style of the day, but it wasn't the music he heard in his soul. This time he would write a piece as much fun as it was to listen to as it was to play. He took the oompa oompa in the left hand, the syncopated rhythms in the right, and called it Maple Leaf Rag after the club where he played. Something told Scott it was special, but the publishers turned him down. Much too difficult, they said. But Scott wasn't about to give up. He got an idea. He played the piece for a music publisher, John Stark, while a group of kids danced and wiggled to the catchy tune. It was impossible to sit still. At last, John Stark said the words that Scott longed to hear. They had a deal and a contract. It was an uncommon arrangement for an unknown composer, especially one who was African-American but Scott believed in his music and John Stark was willing to take a chance. For the first year, sales were slow, but by the autumn of 1900, the maple leaf rag was heard in every parlor, dance hall, and theater. This ragtime hit had taken the nation by storm. A new cover to the sheet music was printed, this time with Scott's photograph and the proud proclamation by King of Ragtime writers, Scott Joplin. Soon Scott's name was known throughout the land. With the success of the Maple Leaf Rag, he was able to leave the world of saloons behind and focus on what he loved the most, writing music. 
Scott went on to write many more ragtime pieces, taking the oompa in his left hand and the raggedy jaggedy syncopations in his right. He sat down at the piano and with both hands created a new music, an American music like the country itself, a patchwork of sound and colors. And that, my friends, is the end of our book. Thank you for joining me for the history of the King of Ragtime himself, Scott Joplin. This book is available for checkout at our youth services department downstairs. So feel free to come down, visit, check it out, or at least, uh, you know, check it out. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day, everybody. See ya.